Welcome back to How You Slice It. Uh, Steve Green is a former Domino's franchisee. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. And um, uh, one of the uh, pioneers and just brilliant minds, a marketing expert, publisher of the top pizza trade magazine, PMQ, which I believe stands for Pizza Marketing Quarterly, although it's become so much more than that. Uh, as always, my favorite time of the year is December in the pizza industry because PMQ releases the annual Pizza Power Report. And this year's report, like years past, is full of amazing information and insights and data. And specifically, the thing that I was most excited about was to read about this renaissance of independence, uh, which I'd love to to talk to Steve about. But today we'll discuss that. Uh, plus many other opportunities and challenges facing the industry. Uh, and with that said, Steve, welcome to How You Slice It. Thank you so much for making time for us. Please uh, please introduce yourself, uh, although you need no introduction. Okay. My name is Steve Green. Uh, I, uh, I'm i the publisher of PMQ Magazine. I used to be a Domino's Pizza franchisee. Uh, I, I worked... Uh, on a project with Steve Jobs in 1995 uh, to, uh, he ordered the first pizza on the first online national online ordering system, uh, which turned into food.com. And uh, he was very excited about the pizza industry. You know, of all people that ought to be an inspiration. He's one of my heroes, uh, not just because he was, you know, a great uh, inspiration and a innovator but because he really did have an appreciation for pizza. And when he was thrown away, when he was kicked to the curb from Apple, he started Next Software. And it was Next Software that ended up saving Apple and bringing Apple back. And so it's a pretty dramatic story. But he was very excited about pizza because he thought – that, that pizza was the killer application to explain people how the Internet worked and his investment in the uh, Next Software's web objects. That was the name of his program. One of the very first and the most uh, notable was the use of it to order pizza. And Cyberslice.com uh, was the first usage of of this other than I think an airline was one of the first one. I think yeah. United or somebody, but, but he was excited about uh, the, the pizza and he volunteered immediately to order the first pizza. And so I, I, it's just I remember the story you, uh, yeah. you shared the story with me. You even introduced me to Tim Glass, who was the founder That's right. of, That's uh, right. of cyber slice. What a name, by the way, I, I may just rebrand slice back to cyber slice because yeah, come on cyber. Um, but I, I think, and what you shared with me is when cyber slice launched because they were built on top of the next platform, mm -hmm. Steve jobs was there for the, to announce the launch of cyber slice. Yes. Yeah, it sure was. Um, which is, uh, just an incredible story. One that I, mm -hmm. uh, I will try and tell more, more frequently yeah. to, uh, to anyone that I meet. The, uh, uh let me oh, just add to that. Yeah. They wouldn't let me go down to the to the grand ceremony. I had to stay back in Seattle, and I was the guy who were watching the emails of people apologizing for ordering. They were just testing out the system. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so I was That's... I was the pizza guy, and we didn't get as much respect as the uh, the high tech people. <laughs> but it was a it was an honor to be there. What a great story! Um, I'd love to to zoom out a little bit and talk talk to, to the audience a little bit about why pizza for you and how did you get to start PMQ? Like what was the vision and, and why? Well, I was, I was uh, totally impressed with Domino's. Uh, it wasn't pizza as much as it was Domino's. I was publishing a cable guide during the 1970s and uh, uh, we had had all the pizzerias in town advertising on our magazine because it was a coupon clipper. And when Domino's came in, I thought, oh, that's great. Another advertiser for us. But how many pizzerias can you want uh, in, a, in a college town? Uh, 
But when they came in, they totally they totally rearranged the whole pizza industry in our town. They dominated. And um, I remember walking in there one time and I was just amazed at the engineering behind all the steps. And I was fascinated how efficient they were. And I just uh, I, I made a note of that. And then about a month later, uh, there was an advertisement in our local newspaper that said that, that Domino's was looking for a store opening specialist to open up new stores. And so I I called and I got an appointment and I they hired me as a store opening specialist. And then that's how I got uh, started in pizza. And uh, I, I ended up having a really great lucky streak or smart streak. I'm not ever not sure what it was, but the, they asked me to open the first store in New Orleans where they had zero name recognition. It was the first store there. And uh, I did some things that, uh, that were apparently unique and different. And I ended up breaking the national sales record for Domino's Pizza uh, for a residential store. And that was very important for Domino's because they really just thought that their niche was in military bases and campus stores. And mm. for them to break a national sales record with a residential store really changed a lot of minds in Domino's, and it opened up the possibility that people could make a lot of money for a long time in the pizza industry. What a what a story. And um, what are what's one of those things you like? Uh, you certainly had a had a formula for success. What is uh, one thing that sticks out from the way that you operated that store that led well, to the to the breakout? Well, to me, it, I didn't really, you know, I'd gotten an MBA, so I I just, I mean, not that I attribute it to an MBA, but I just uh, store. I just did the things that uh, I thought should have been done. There were some things that Domino's was doing really well that I really appreciated, like door hanging, direct mail. Uh, those were that was basically their marketing campaign. But I built on that because, uh, you know, we I, I wanted to hit people like three times in the head with the Domino's message during a short period of time during, say, a 10 day mm. period in order to because uh, we were going for the national sales record. So uh, we timed it so that the sales would come in in the first full week that we were open. That's what when they started counting. So uh, we had the direct mail hit. We organized all the door hanging. Uh, we had a bicycle built for six, uh, and they drove around uh, the area. So smart. Yeah. 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 We, had, we had these cups, uh, and we put coupons in them, and we stopped traffic and passed them in cars. <laughs> we, we had all the – we flyered all the shopping centers, and um, – we we had we I had like three people that were just assigned for marketing purposes so that they would not get sucked into operations. That's usually what kills a grand opening is that, you know, the phones ring and and fortunately, the marketing people didn't know how to make pizzas. They weren't trained to answer phones. So they were just we were ready to keep the accelerator on during that week in order to, to do all the things to create visual noise in the local neighborhoods and and get the uh, get the sales up. So so we, we ended up doing that and then I had a little bit more time to plan the Tupelo, Mississippi opening. And we we opened um, we opened New Orleans at twenty thousand. Uh, that that won me a uh, if you did twenty thousand, you ended up getting a Rolex watch from Tom Monahan. That was his challenge. Oh my God, that's so cool! Yeah, and so, you still have it. Yeah. So I have my initials on the back with Tom Monahan's initials, uh, but he would hand these out to uh, to people when they would do twenty thousand. So so we got the Rolex watch, and so uh, when we went to uh, Tupelo, I ended up doing those things plus additional 
things. Tupelo was a great market because it had a, it was its own TV market. So we really blew the doors down. We had an airplane buzz pizza hut with a sign <laughs> saying Domino's deliveries. We, we went crazy. We had our bicycle built for six. Again, we brought up to, to Tupelo, but we did $37,000 worth of pizza. And that was wow. the grand opening sales record for over 10 years until wow. Hawaii beat it by selling $25 pizzas instead of our $10 pizzas that we, we were selling in Tupelo. I would say inflation maybe had something to do with that record. Yeah, eventually yeah. inflation probably had something yeah. to do with it too. Um, so marketing is at the core of you know what you think about when you think about launching successful shops. Mm-hmm. You know, pizza marketing quarterly. How did how did PMQ launch? Well, actually, it it kind of evolved because to make a long story short, uh, I ended up I. I I opened a Domino's pizza store in Buffalo, New York. Uh, mm-hmm. It was very competitive. I, I threw away my playbook for opening stores in New York, and I started using the computer to uh, to track customers. And so mm-hmm. I created an algorithm to uh, to track customers, to find out, to ad- to easily identify who the new customers, the the exiting customers, the regular customers, and most importantly, the non customers. And I would have direct mail programs that worked on all of these different different uh, subgroups. And so I created a program that I called Green Mail. And I, I, I ended up working with my friends who were Domino's Pizza franchisees. And I ended up having about 10% of the Domino's Pizza franchisees using my system. Wow. And Till Domino's went into competition with me and created their own. <laughs> and so then I started, I didn't want to, but then I started working with independents since they, they were, uh, I was really dedicated to Domino's. I just wanted to work for Domino's, but, but uh, I was uh, forced. And fortunately, uh, it allowed me to go into the independent segment. So I, I published a newsletter talking about my marketing service, and it was called Pizza Marketing Quarterly. And it ended up, uh, I ended up having some advertisers that wanted to sponsor it, and it really just literally grew into PMQ, the magazine. And uh, I never changed the name of it uh, because I had the website PMQ, and I thought, you know, it's just, I don't want to change my name. I'll just be PMQ. I'll, I'll be like Gentleman's Quarterly. And I'm I'm so glad you didn't. And PMQ for me has been a must read, you know, in terms of every issue. And for the listeners, which mostly are owner operators and, and shop operators, uh, to the extent that they're not spending some time each month reading the PMQ magazine, um, highly, highly recommend that they do that. And uh, when was the first year that you... Uh, uh, that you focused on the Pizza Power Report. Uh, tell uh, us a little bit about that. I, I think in 1997, when I started the first issue, I had the beginnings of the Pizza Power Report in there because I was always curious to know where the pizzerias were in the country and how many owners there were for all the pizzerias uh, because those were my customers. I, I would find people that owned stores, single stores, multiple stores, and work for them. So I ended up mapping it out and it gave me a nice map of the United States and it showed where all the where more pizzerias per capita were. And so Mm. that was in a way that was the beginning of the Pizza Power Report in the first issue of October or the fall of 97. But I didn't start calling it the Pizza Power Report and I really pumped it up in 2K. Uh, So it's it's been almost 20 years that we've been yeah. officially doing the Pizza Power Report. Amazing. And it's, uh, uh, I believe you have a couple of partners from the data side, uh, which you can talk about. But mm-hmm. I want to I want to fast forward to this year's Pizza Power Report. And again, for me, on an annual basis in December, PMQ launches this report, which is a both a look back in terms of where the industry is this year, Mm-hmm. And a look forward in terms of where it's headed in 2023, and therefore the reports uh, 
date or a year is always the, the year after. And so mm-hmm. um, just published this year's report, spent a significant time reading it. I shared it with the entire team at Slice. Uh, it's a must read That's here great. at Slice. I love it. And um, the first thing that really popped out, I mean, it's literally on the on the headline is the emergence of the independence. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk talk a little bit about the main takeaway uh, and the head title really on uh, on this year's report. Well, I think I think that uh, last year we the independent had a bad year. Of course, we're you know because we're going backwards, uh, looking at you know the the year that just uh, ended up. Actually, with CHD, we we take a photograph of the industry on October first, the end of the third quarter of the previous year. So uh, this came out in December. We looked at sales uh, according to CHD from the beginning of the fourth quarter of last year to this current year uh, to October 1st. And during that period of time, the independents uh, were the ones that were more active than the chains. The previous year, the chains were, their sales were up and independents were down. The reverse was true uh, this year. And I think part of it is because the the of course sixty percent of all the pizzerias are are independent. Uh, most of the pizzerias are independent, but uh, most of the sales come from the chains who have a minority stake in it. So that yeah. that mix has certainly shifted going into twenty three, right? For twenty twenty two, what I saw was net six thousand new independents open. Right, right. Their same store sales increased. And we saw the opposite for chains, which is kind of bucking the trend, correct? That's right. That's right. And it's either because the uh, uh, I've had a couple. Of, we've talked about this at the office and we thought, well, are the are the chains? Are they the ones that know better or the or the independents just more bold? Are they just saying, what the hell? I'm going to go into the pizza business regardless of the market. I don't think there's been a better time to go into the market right now. If you really explore and understand the new market, the way technology is helping uh, everybody, whether they're independent or chains, technology has made the pizza model more efficient, more lucrative. And uh, if you do things with the help of an entire army of technology supporting uh, there's an infrastructure now of technologists, uh, including Slice, with 18,000 uh, customers uh, that that have made pizza more profitable. We've been looking at these companies. PMQ.com slash technology is a shortcut to uh, about 300 uh, companies that are in the restaurant industry that that have a variety of different ways to bring technology uh, to help increase sales and lower costs and, you know, all the things. There's so many ways that that people have thought of how to boost sales and profits uh, in the restaurant business uh, and they're available now. It's, a, it's certainly, uh, I couldn't agree more. It's an amazing time of the industry. I think from my perspective, and uh, I've been having these conversations with our team, I think uh, as the job market tightens and there's certainly news of layoffs in different uh, different parts of the economy, first thing that happens is people want to just control their own destiny. And, um, mm-hmm. and so many people have become makers uh, through – easy access to YouTube videos or PMQ or other other publishers that uh, help us learn how to make really good pizza and test ways to make differentiated uh, pizza products. And then finally, the last step of that is through the technology you're referencing, the barriers to entry mm-hmm. uh, for opening up a pizza shop have just completely come down. It's a lot easier today to launch and succeed as an independent pizza owner 
than it was 20 years ago. And I think sort of the mix of those things is leading to this uh, independent pizza renaissance. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to chains, my perspective is that uh, people don't want to really give up their creative freedom. Right. Uh, they want to maintain that. Right. And I think the only trade-off, the only downside to a Domino's or a Papa John's is you cannot be yourself. You've right. got to be Domino's. Yeah. And so um, I think it's pretty fascinating to see the the growth and 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 independence just yeah. kind of breaking out here in 22 going into 23. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would just put an ex, exclamation point by what you just said. And I, I was I've never had. I've never made more money in my life or had had an easier job than franchising with Domino's. But I didn't I really didn't enjoy it that much because it was it was uh, it wasn't, you know, satisfying to me. Uh, and I really liked doing marketing for other people. And that's what I ended up doing with my time. I had managers manage my store and I, I was out trying to raise sales for my other buddies. But uh, it's so true. You want to be able to, uh, I I think if I were to go into the business now, I would do it my own way. I would, I would reinvent everything for myself, for my market, you know, for uh, to customize it, to outmaneuver my local competition. It doesn't matter what they're doing on a national scale. You're, you're a farmer You've got a certain amount of territory, and you have to farm and get the most out of the demographics you have. You're not going to change your demographics. Mm. You're going to have to to till the soil that's in your market and and do it in a creative way. And I, I see people doing that all the time, and I'm inspired. PMQ is it, we're not geniuses sitting in an office coming up with all this stuff. We are. We, this is PMQ is written by the industry. We we know. I know as a former Domino's franchisee, the real smarts that I got came from my peers, and that's where we look for wisdom and information and inspiration is from uh, the people that are running the stores, and they tell us stories every day, and it never gets old. I can't believe that I'm still doing this after 25 years. I remember when I first started the magazine, I was thinking, oh, what am I going to write about next month or the month? (laughs) But, you know, the longer you're in here, the more people you have calling you, you have more photographs that come in, more ideas. It's really easier to just, I mean, it kind of writes itself now just because, uh, you know, people know about us and, and we Absolutely. were kind of a conduit. Absolutely. And uh, I, I can attest to that. I remember uh, in 2011, I had a little tiny office in Staten Island, New York. I and remember. You came, to vi- you came to visit me yeah. and we did a we did an interview. And I, I have the CD you sent me of that interview. Yeah. Um, which is uh, which is something I'll, I'll cherish. Getting back to the Pizza Power Report, what are some of the one or two of the risks or the challenges facing the industry. I know there's a reference around staffing. There's a reference around food costs. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the two, you know, the two things that are always the biggest, uh, you know, those are the biggest percentages of your, of your costs. And both of those are, you know, happen to be a problem at the same time. Um, So, I, I think there's some technology that helps in both of those areas, so I would I would look into that. But uh, you know, there's I've seen a lot of people that have you know their solution to uh, to recruiting is creating an environment that that makes it a fun place to work. You know, food cost can you know can be one part shopping around. It can be you know, being creative with your menu, uh, adjusting your sales, uh, selling what's more expensive. Not selling or, or carrying products that are not selling. I see so many yeah. shop owners yeah, that's carry a great products one. that are yeah. just not selling. Right. Uh, but I think, I think that's driven 
by the lack of visibility they have in terms of what consumers are buying versus uh-huh. not buying. Yeah. Which kind of kind of leads me to the technology side. That's the power of technology. Look, I think on the staffing side, and we can talk about this a bit, so many operators I speak to think of online ordering as a marketing tool, as a tool to get me more orders. But for me and what I've learned in my experience is it's equally an efficiency tool. It's mm-hmm. a tool to streamline the way customers place an order. Uh, it removes the bottleneck of having to answer the phone. It means that a person who, or you as an owner operator, having to answer the phone, you now can focus on serving the customers in the store or making sure deliveries are going out. So I think, um, you know, online ordering isn't just about incremental orders. It's also about reducing the cost uh, that it takes to serve the customers who are placing an order. That's true. That's I think that's been... Uh, in the last five years, that it used to all be marketing, didn't it? At one time, it was just, you know, you wanted to have online ordering just to show that you were one of the leaders of the industry. It was maybe 5% difference. Now it's a question of, are you making, you know, the mistakes that come with not being digital uh, that happen when you have human beings processing every order manually? And uh, that goes away. Even when I was the Domino's franchisee, we thought we were, you know, the the gold standard for efficiency and time of delivery. We regularly had 5% mistakes on our orders. And Mm. uh, that's when things were handwritten. Uh, And so so you're right about that. Online ordering is is a a necessity now. I I can't imagine not using it. I read that. Uh, I think just close to 30% of the independent pizza shops still don't have online ordering. Yeah. What, what's your message to that cohort? I would, you know, the question is, is how, how is it that they're not? Maybe because they still know of some of their competitors that haven't transitioned. Maybe they're the laggards. Uh, mm. And usually, you know, I remember in marketing, we always talked about the early adopters and the laggards. Eventually, the laggards do go away, uh, you know, or they're just a, a, a niche that they, they'll – that's what makes them. That is mm-hmm. their advantage, that they're the white space of the, you know, of the pizza industry. Um, but I, I would certainly uh, – I, I think what's important about the, the pizza expo, different pizza shows – the PMQ think tank online is to talk to your peers and find out who your business partners are going to be. There's all these people that can help. And really, I think your number one job at this point might be finding the right technology partners. Who's going to help you make less mistakes? Who's going to help you uh, make more money? That's a little bit of research, you'll find people that have all that have just during the last year taken people from from manual to to technology. There's other people out there like you uh, that technology people have helped, and they can help you too. But uh, the point is, is to find the right partners. And there's some great choices out there. You're in the driver's seat. Uh, you're you're you've got a shopping cart and you've got a store. People want to do business with you. You have some power. You have the power to make partners. Find your partners. That that would be my message. Absolutely. And I and what I've seen in the pizza industry is the willingness for anyone in the industry to partner with you. And yeah. so there's just this open mentality. People mm-hmm. are always open minded about about partnerships. Um, what are your like? one or two big um, predictions for the industry in the coming years. Where do you think it's headed? Well, I think it's it's got such momentum. I can't imagine that it wouldn't stop moving uh, in people adopting, um, you know, online ordering. I, th- I personally, my, my hope, I've always, I've always believed in pizza TV. Uh, that's a that's a project that we've been working on for 20 years. When 
I, I, I thought of it back in the Steve Jobs day. I, I always thought there ought to be a place where, where there's movie trailers of all the pizzerias in the country where, where you can go. What, what I see happening economically, I think that Domino's and the chains have a built-in system where they're financing marketing because of their franchise fees, because of the buying power that they have. I think that independents have just as big of piggy bank that hasn't been tapped into yet. And I think that is the suppliers like the cheese companies, the oven companies, all these companies it's in their interest to make sure that independents sell more pizza. Mm. They're more incentivized to want to help independents than they are the chains, even though they help the chains because they're organized. So you've got a group of 18,000 people, uh, but even independent, uh, independent people, I think once you can go to Grande Cheese, for example, and that's who we deal with. PMQ deals with all these suppliers. We'd mm-hmm. like to go to those suppliers and say, why don't we do a national promotion? We'll tie it in with the cable TV show. We'll have an advertisement during the, the, the TV show. And we'll have people order a special independent hotline. And, you know, I could see the same people that buy ads in, in PMQ now. I'd like to see. This is my prediction for the future. This, and I'm pushing yes. this, but I, yeah. I think it's going to happen. I think we're going to get into the consumer budgets of these food service companies that we're doing business with now. And I think when we get into their consumer budgets, those are usually 10, 15 times as big as the food service budgets. And all mm. of a sudden, there's going to be a lot of money, a lot of promo, and whether it's digitally spent locally or whether it's, uh, you know, contributed to, uh, uh, you know, a national promotion like we did with the History Channel. So anyway, that's one of the things I see. I I see some marketing opportunities for independence. I think that's going to be big. I I think that's really powerful. What I'm hearing also is sort of this opportunity for independence to unite in, in, in a certain way where the collective spending power on marketing can certainly be the tide that lifts all boats. Right. Is that, right. Is that a good way to say it? Yes, absolutely. And the fact that they're independent, people secretly empathize with the local guy. They they empathize. Absolutely. They they know that the independent they they have an emotional and automatic emotional attachment to the underdog, the independent. And uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I love to get a hold of independents sometimes and I'll just record them and I'll say, why is your pizza? Why is independent pizza better than chain pizza, for example? And they'll they'll get going. There's a lot of great <laughs> voices, a lot of, uh, you, you know, I, I it's hard to you can't slice. I, I remember going to your conference before and you had all these yes. great independents there that were just you know, excited about the business and they can talk endlessly about, uh, about themselves, about their pizza. This is always my biggest advice for independence is that the biggest asset you have is you. And when I, I won 10 Rolex watches for buddies that asked me to open their store. And when I went in there and I created a marketing plan for them, I always would use them as the star of their pizzeria and put their personality into the into the store. Even though they were dominoes, they still connected because it was a person. And yes. when you're talking about the pizza business, you're talking about an ultimate service because it's feeding you know, feeding somebody that is a service and nothing personifies service like a person. So it's not a logo that a customer wants to see. They want to see a face, even if it's a rugged 
face of just a <laughs> guy. The more like a pizza guy they look like, the more legitimate the pizza is. So I would say don't sell yourself short. I know you might think, oh, I don't want to make a big deal out of myself, but just do it for mercenary purposes. Do it because it works. You know, yeah, capitalize on your own personality, your own face, cut your own radio commercials. Uh, you know, let people know that you're the man that stands behind your your product, behind your pizza. I love that. And um, I, I really don't want to ruin it with any other questions. And so we'll we'll end it there. Steve, thank you so much for taking time. I continue to be inspired by you and everyone at PMQ and the work that you're doing is continuing to push the pizza industry forward. And you've been doing it for uh, for a long time. And mm -hmm. cheers to, uh, to hopefully you doing it for another 20 years. Thank you very much, Alir. I really appreciate being on your show today.